When I was five, I used to be extremely energetic. I could never sit in one place, and as a result, I set out on many different adventures. I used to fly kites and feed ducks at my local park and make forts out of blankets and pillows. But my favorite adventure was going to my local science museum. Every week, I asked my parents to take me there as I was intrigued by the intricacy of the human skeleton exhibits and dinosaur fossils. My mom saw my early enthusiasm in science and started to read to me fun science books and science encyclopedias. Questions started to form in my mind and I remember asking mom, why does a penny sink in water but float in honey? Eventually, I started conducting projects to answer my questions. In fifth grade, one of the science units covered in my curriculum was anatomy. My teacher's mesmerization in this field was contagious and I became fascinated with the details and mechanical nature of anatomy. As a result, I started conducting science fair projects in one of the most sophisticated laboratories I know, my home. For example, in fifth grade, I conducted a science fair project where I measured the effect of blood viscosity on blood flow rate. To do this, I used different types of milk as my blood and recorded how fast it took for the milk to flow from the bucket through a tube into the bathtub. My love for human biology only grew when I heard Dr. Mark Skizzle, the president of the University of Michigan, talk about the need for pancreatic cancer diagnosis. His talk inspired me to come up with a diagnostic tool for pancreatic cancer. But before we dive in deep inside my research, what really is pancreatic cancer? Pancreatic cancer is one of the most deadliest cancers in the world, affecting great minds like Steve Jobs, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, John Lewis, and Alex Trebek. In fact, its mortality rate is at 85% because of the lack of early diagnosis. As shown in figure one, early diagnosis of pancreatic cancer is difficult because of the location of the pancreas. This spongy organ, which helps maintain blood glucose levels and digestion, is found behind the stomach and deep behind the intestines, making imaging unclear. Since there is no specific screening scan for pancreatic cancer today, the early diagnosis rate is at 9%, whereas the majority of pancreatic cancer patients are diagnosed in a later stage or stages 3 or 4. In figure 2, one can see how the five-year survival rate of different cancers has changed over a 30-year span. One can see that breast cancer has increased from 75 to 90 percent and colorectal from 50 to 65 percent. However, pancreatic cancer survival rate has stayed at a constant 10 percent. Clearly, there is something wrong. Once again, this is affiliated because of the lack of early diagnosis as since the majority of patients are diagnosed in a later stage, they only have 10 months to survive. But if the majority of pancreatic cancer patients were diagnosed in an earlier stage, this would increase to 22 months. In fact, the National Institute of Health stated that if the majority of pancreatic cancer patients were diagnosed in an early stage, the five-year survival rate would increase from 10% to 40%. Another problem with pancreatic cancer is that it is misdiagnosed as diabetes 20% of the time. This is because of similarities in symptoms and gene expression. Current research achieves around 70 to 75% accuracy in diagnosis because it doesn't take into account early diagnosis and misdiagnosis. Thus, the purpose of this project was simple, to develop a diagnostic tool for pancreatic cancer that is accessible, affordable, and accurate by measuring the expression of 19 genes in pancreatic cancer and diabetes. To do this, I established criteria or engineering goals to evaluate how well the algorithms work. To do this, four different attributes were identified. Knowing the difference between the four groups or combinations between diabetes and pancreatic cancer at an accuracy of 90%, having an accuracy of 90% in both early and late stage diagnosis, providing a user interface to make the algorithms accessible and making sure the design was cheap. So now you all might be wondering why I decided to use algorithms to diagnose pancreatic cancer. This is because of the specificity of these algorithms. Currently, the major way pancreatic cancer diagnosis research is addressed is through protein assays or tests. The premise of these diagnosis tests 
is to determine if a patient has pancreatic cancer based on the difference in one or a couple of proteins. But since pancreatic cancer is such a complex disease, a couple of proteins is not enough to diagnose pancreatic cancer 100% of the time. Current protein assays focus on the CRAS gene, which is differentially expressed around 95% of the time in pancreatic cancer patients, or the TP53 gene, which is irregularly expressed 70% of the time. But the problem is these genes are also differentially expressed in other cancers, such as colon and breast cancer. Thus, this shows how these protein tests often lead to misdiagnosis of pancreatic cancer. Since algorithms are able to evaluate a larger gene pool and several genes and proteins, we're, they're able to be more specific to pancreatic cancer. This helps combat the errors of misdiagnosis and leads to more accurate diagnosis. After creating the algorithms, a user interface or app-like system was created in order for the algorithms to be used more clinically. The purpose of this user interface was to tell if a patient had pancreatic cancer or not. Over here, you can see that this patient has early stage pancreatic cancer. One of the algorithms was able to predict that the patient had pancreatic cancer at a 90% accuracy. Here, you can see the overall results of my algorithm. It may seem like a bunch of lines and numbers, but trust me, there is more to this. You can see that all of the algorithms except the random forest algorithm achieved an accuracy of over 90% for pancreatic cancer diagnosis. An early stage di pan pancreatic cancer diagnosis accuracy of over 90% was achieved for all of the algorithms except the logistic regression and random forest algorithms. Thus, we see that three of these algorithms were not only able to achieve the engineering criteria, but they're the first um, methods in literature that were able to achieve a pancreatic cancer diagnosis accuracy of over 90%. Since my algorithms perform fairly well, I evaluated the connection between the 19 genes to see if they had something to do with the outcome. Using bioinformatics tools, or more simply put, computational tools which measure genetic analysis, it was found that the 19 genes were involved in three major pathways. The first was the red pathway, which controlled the structure of the cytoplasm, or liquid substance inside the cell, the green pathway, which controlled the outer, outer shape of the cell, or the cytoskeleton, and the blue pathway, the functionality of the nucleus. In addition, I extracted tissue samples of pancreatic cancer and diabetes uh, patients to see the differences in the cellular properties, specifically the cytoplasm, nucleus, and cytoskeleton, to analyze the area as well as aspect ratio or roundness. As shown in this graph, there was a difference in the cellular attributes, specifically the area and aspect ratio, when pancreatic cancer was present. And this difference was exaggerated when diabetes was present. More specifically, we can see that pancreatic cancer and diabetes are involved in the three pathways mentioned earlier. This graph shows how these genes are involved in the respective pathways at a 90% confidence coefficient, specifically in the pancreas as expression levels are high. The overarching conclusion received here is that these 19 genes are key biomarkers in differentiating between pancreatic cancer and diabetes. Through literature reviews, it was found that, this, that these genes are upregulated in pancreatic cancer 84% of the time, thus supporting our findings. Even though my algorithms achieved relatively high accuracy, there were still some limitations, specifically on the clinical side. To measure gene expression, one needs to analyze the protein production being produced by the gene. To do this, one needs to conduct Western blot analysis, which can be hard to do as tissues need to be extracted. This can cost $650 and take 10 days to conduct. To make this project more clinically applicable, I am expanding it to serum microRNA data. To understand the clinical, clinical applicability of microRNAs, we need to understand their function. MicroRNAs are small fragments of RNA, which don't code for anything and instead bind to another type of RNA called messenger RNA and prevent the production of proteins. 
microRNAs have been found to be irregularly expressed in cancer and cause key characteristics of the disease, such as excessive cell growth and a decrease in cell death. Since microRNAs are what control gene expression, they can be easily extracted through blood samples and a technique called PCR. This only takes $75 and five days to conduct. Making this tool more adaptable to microRNA data will not only help us, help us find a more specific tool for pancreatic cancer diagnosis, but will help us advance the field of personalized medicine, a phenomenon where we give patients treatment based on their own genetic makeup instead of a one-size-fits-all method. Machine learning can help us identify the differences between pancreatic cancer in controlled patients and early and late stage pancreatic cancer samples. By, by doing this, we will be able to find more specific biomarkers, thus advancing the field of personalized medicine. As a high schooler, I never thought that I would be able to get this far with my research. After working hours trying to debug my code, I would end up frustrated because my algorithms would not work. I thought that giving up would be a better option as there was a 99% chance I was going to fail. But through perseverance and the help of my mentors, Dr. Clark Denny and Dr. Jean Honorio, professors at Purdue University, and Dr. Inhan Lee, a professor at the University of Michigan, I was able to beat the odds and make an innovation that can potentially help society. By, by working with other professionals in the field, I hope to one day prove the National Institute of Health right and increase the five-year survival rate of pancreatic cancer from 10 to 40%. Thank you.